Good morning, good morning. How's it going, second service crew? How's everybody doing out there? What's up, family? How's it going, online community, Parachute? So awesome to have you. Happy September, everyone. It is September, so you better believe I'm going to be in long sleeves from here on out. Um, how's everybody doing? You guys doing good? Good. Awesome. Hey, so awesome, awesome news. I just got the okay that I can, I can uh, share this. Baby Sheets, little Zoe Sheets was born early morning on Thursday. Man, it was like 3 in the morning. They just made it to the hospital. But um, they have welcomed that baby home, and they are uh, they're just, you know, getting used to being a family. So it's so awesome. It's um, David and Kat. They usually sit right on over here. Uh, so it, they're from our greenhouse. So if you are in our greenhouse, we're going to send out that meal train info soon. I know that uh, Jamal and Holly have already made like 20 meals and are ready to bless them for the next couple months. So we'll slip in there somewhere. Uh, I didn't see them in first service, but maybe they are here for second service. Malcolm and Marissa Krause, they are uh, Lori Krause's, Lori and Peter Krause's son and daughter-in-law. They got married last week. Awesome, awesome service. Pastor John, was that your first wedding? No, I didn't think so. Oh no, your your second, because <laughs> your first was earlier earlier in the summer. That's awesome. Yeah, that's so great. Pastor John said that the the service was amazing. Last Wednesday we had our back to school bash. There were a lot of people in this very room ready for this new school year. And so, uh, if you were a part of making that happen, let's clap it up for everybody on the King's Academy team. Whether it was uh, teachers, staff, volunteers, all of you, you guys all made that an amazing event. We had food trucks and people helping out with merch and uh, all, of the, all of the things that it takes to make sure that everybody knows what's going on for school. So be praying for the school year. Uh, Haley talks about it in announcements. Tuesday night, we will pray over that. So pay attention to the announcements in a bit. Mark Men. Any new brothers and marked men that were at last week's last week's P1, listen, there were about 50 men that came back free and fired up, and I saw a couple of them in, in first service, heard a lot of uh, amazing testimonies already, so we're, we're so glad to just, uh, you know, to see that, that continue and, and the Lord doing a lot there. And lastly... Before you leave, make sure you make your way down, especially if you're an SOS student, the, the new sweatshirts are in, they are selling out, so make your way down to the corridor. SOS merch for sale today, but um, I'm pretty sure that it's not just for SOS students, but you definitely wanna make sure you get down there before the rest of us go down and buy everything else out, okay? You guys good with that? You guys good with that? Okay. So. I know that a lot of people have been all over the place, Six Flags, vacation. We are ready to welcome back pastors Zach and Ashley from vacation. Can't wait to hear all about that. But it is time to worship. It is time to celebrate the Lord and all that he's doing. Let's get excited. Let's get into it. Love you all. Have an awesome service. everyone. Happy Sunday. How many of you excited that school is back? Hmm, I think I heard more parents than kids cheer on that one. Beginning this fall, His Providence will be hosting Trail Life, a church-based, Christ-centered, mentoring and discipleship journey for boys. Set in the context of outdoor adventure, boys from kindergarten through 12th grade are challenged to grow in character, understand their purpose, and serve in their communities. You can sign up at hpc.church slash events. To all the married couples out there, this is a reminder that our marriage conference, Extremely Married, is being held here on November 3rd and 4th. Registration is now open. You can register on the website under the events tab. This Tuesday, we are inviting all teachers and students to Tuesday night prayer as we take some time to pray over them as they enter into the new school year. 
If you are newer visiting this Sunday, we would love to meet you. Make sure you stop by the New Here desk in the lobby. All right, family, it's time to stand up, get rid of those distractions, and get ready for worship. All right, all right, all right. Welcome home. Welcome back. Good to have you all with us this morning. And for everybody who's not here because you're on vacation and you're still watching online, high five to you. Does anybody still watch church while you're on vacation? No, thank you. Doug, kind of like, it depends on where I am and how the weather is and how the uh, Wi-Fi is. That's how it was for me. It's good to be back with you all this morning. And uh, yeah, how many of you know the Lord is good? His word is good. His presence is good. It's like a balm for our souls. And so, Lord, we just invite you here. We invite you here to come and do what you've been longing to do, say what you've been wanting to say. Lord, we just want to have open hearts and open lives that you would continue the good thing that you've begun. We are not our own. We've been bought with a price. And so, Lord, we come as your people today, your nation, your priesthood. How we love you. We give you all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name, be blessed this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. (laughs) Sing this with me. Wandering into the night. Wanting a place to hide. This weary soul. This bag of bones. Come on, say, I try. And I try with all my might. I just can't win the fight And I'm slowly drifting Oh, a vagabond Here we go, just when I, come on, say Just when I ran down the road I met a man I didn't know And he told me that I was not alone You picked me up, yeah what I've seen Got no choice but to believe And my doubts are burning Oh, like ashes in the wind Sing it with me, say So long to my old friends Burden and bitterness So you can just keep moving No, you're not welcome here no more Come on, say from now now till I walk the streets of gold, I'll sing of how you stay my soul. This wayward son has found his way back home. You pick me up, you turn me around, you place my feet on a solid ground. I thank the master, oh, I, I thank the savior. Sing this together.
Praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that calms the storm inside of me. And let it rise. Let praise arise. Come on, sing that with me again. Say, let praise be a weapon that. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise. Let it rise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall.
My freedom, say. My freedom's written in your nail-scarred hands. Where there was sin and shame, the cross now stands. The grave no longer tells me who I am. My freedom's written in your nail-scarred hands. Oh, yeah. If you're thankful for the cross, Paid my ransom 
for that sacrifice for a perfect lamb. Oh, a perfect lamb on a rugged tree shed for you and me. And so I'll cherish the old rugged crawl till my trophies at last I lay down and I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown on a hill go ahead on a hill Stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of loss. So despised by the world Has a wondrous attraction for me For the dear Lamb of God Let His glory abide Come on, sing it with her, church. To be
just to have something to lay before you. Just to have a crown to lay down at your feet, Lord. Just to worship you the way you deserve. To bring the worth that you're worthy of.
on. That's the kingdom coming, saints. That worship, that's the defining factor of the kingdom. It's not the streets of gold. It's not the seas of glass. It's not the gates of pearl. It's the worship of all creation. It's the worship of heaven and earth. It's every knee bowing. It's the sound of every tongue, of every language, every tribe, every nation crying out that he is king of kings and lord of lords and it starts with his people right here and right now oh we worship you lord all the glory to your name and i exalt thee yeah come on tell me i exalt different backgrounds and persuasions and convictions about worship and I know you might be in here this morning and maybe you even come a little late to avoid having to stand or sing for so long because you don't get the point say I can worship in the car on the way here or something like that um, but here's the deal God's calling us deeper than we've ever been we're living in a time that if our love isn't gonna grow colder, it's because it has to grow hotter. And, and that's the only way to avoid that lukewarm nonsense that's out there. And that's the only thing he'll stand for, is the ones who are so passionate and so in such hot pursuit of him that nothing else matters. That's the kingdom coming. The closer we are to the Lord, the more everything else disappears. Remember that old song? Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Well, here's the deal. The eyes that are closest to Jesus, the angels and the saints that are around the throne, they're not standing there twiddling their thumbs, swiping through their cell phones, thinking about anything else. The kingdom is there. The kingdom is the kingdom because of the worship. Because those who are around him, those who are in proximity to him, those with that intimate relationship, and that equity to back up their faith, their boldness, and their surrender. It's because it's expressed through worship. And I know over the years, we've had a lot of people come through and, well, it's not just about the presence, it's not just about this, it's not just about that. I'm gonna tell you something. Everything else goes away but worship. Preaching goes away. There's nobody preaching sermons in heaven. There's nobody evangelizing on those golden streets. There's nobody left to save. All that's left to do is give God the glory that he's worthy of. There's no other thought in, in our head and saints, that's the kingdom coming now is that we get so close to him that no matter what we're doing, whether it's out in the marketplace, whether it's, it's serving down the corridor, whether it's at these altars or in the parking lot, whether it's in your office cubicle or, or, or at your home in your kitchen, it's, it's coming out as worship. It's happening as worship. And that's why creation is so desperate for the manifestations of the sons and daughters of God because when we manifest as his sons and daughters, it's in the act of expressing our worship, our relationship with him. So get closer and worship harder than you've ever done. I believe he's looking to and fro over the face of the earth to find somebody who'd say, I'll become more undignified than I was yesterday. I'll worship harder than I did last Sunday. I'll pour something else out. I'll break a new box. I'll sing a new song. Because you're worthy of it, Lord. You're worthy of it, Lord. Listen, if you're in here this morning 
and uh, the Lord's calling you to, into a season of, um, of, of increased faith, increased surrender, increased submission, increased sacrifice. And you're looking at it like, my God, that's gonna be hard. Oh, this is gonna be tough. This is gonna be a, a heck of a fall. Well, it can be a heaven of a fall if you come into it with worship. Because whatever the sacrifice that's required, whatever the shoes that need to be taken off, whatever the, whatever the, the, the offering that needs to be burnt up, all that stuff just makes sense when we're worshiping the way that we should. And so if he's called you into a new season of whatever that looks like, would you step out of your seats and worship with me at this altar this morning? Because we have to turn up the worship. All the other stuff, it, it falls into alignment when we turn up our praise, when we level up in our offering to the Lord. And so this church is, is historically just been brimming with people who have a call of God on their lives, who have just an incredible mantle and anointing and who are walking with it. I think everybody has an incredible call of God. We just don't always walk in it. But many of you are here because you've already stepped out and you're already building momentum. But I want you to know that if we're not marrying our worship to his revelation, our response, an appropriate response to what he's showing us and where he's calling us, it is gonna be hard. It's gonna be hard. I mean, people look at stuff that happens here and they're like, wow, that seems impossible. It would be impossible because if we were doing it without worship, we'd be doing it in our own strength. But when we lean in, when we go deeper, when we press in further, he finds a place to sit. He finds a place to be enthroned. He finds a place to inhabit and he finds a place to flex. And suddenly it's not our strength moving mountains. It's not our ingenuity and our creativity and our, and our plans and our constructs that are getting things done that are parting seas and waters. No, it's the hand of God. And so I wanna encourage you saints in this room, those of you who are stepping out, who are coming down to this altar. I don't know where you're at with your worship. I know many of you and I know that you're already leaps and bounds ahead of the game because of that passionate pursuit. But let the Lord draw something new out of you. David of all people says, sing a new song to the Lord. Really David, you had more songs than anybody else. Just pick one of the hits, you know? Just sing one of the hits. And dude's like, no, he's worthy of a new one. He's worthy of a new one. He's calling you out to uncertain places, things that would otherwise be scary. And this call, it's a call over the side of the boat to step out on something that without him, it would never hold your weight. That's why so many folks pressing in, they do fall flat on their faces because their eyes aren't on Jesus. When our eyes are on Jesus, what comes out of us is not a, oh, I don't know if this is gonna work. What comes out is a holy, 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 holy is the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world. Worthy, worthy is the one who can open the scroll. That's the worship that comes out when we're face to face with the Lord. Press into him this morning. Jesus, Jesus. Come on, Jen, let's do it. Take a couple steps forward. These squares are two by two. So take just four feet. There you go. Come on a little closer. This is what this is about. It's coming closer. Not to me. Not to me. I spit when I sing. So y'all are about to get baptized down here. 
This is about pushing in closer than you've been before, closer than you're comfortable with. Don't come, don't come down and find a comfortable spot. Come down and, and, and get uncomfortable. Get inconvenienced. Jesus, let's do it again. You call me up upon the water. Yeah.
have your prize Come and take what's yours It's no longer mine time just your voices let's say spirit lead me spirit lead me where my trust is without borders There's two things that are happening in the room right now. And I want you to be aware of what's actually taking place. See, a spirit of religion, what it'll want you to do right now is to work hard enough to obtain what you feel like the Lord is calling you to. But that work was already done. Pastor Zach quoted out of Romans 8. And Romans 8 and 9 says that this is not a work you can actually do yourself, but you need to partner with what the Lord is doing. Our work is crucifying our flesh on that cross, picking up your cross and following him. Because the actual work was already done on the cross for salvation and for healing. That work was already done. But as sons and daughters of God, the ones that the world is longing to see manifested are those that say yes to crucifying their flesh. But a spirit of religion will want to tell you, you can work hard for it. But in Romans 9, that same spirit of religion is what caused the Jews to reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. It became a stumbling block to them because they thought they could do enough. And so what's happening is, is that the first message that you can't work hard enough to earn it is offending some of the other ones of you in the room that a spirit of religion has lied to and says, well, that work was already done. I don't actually have to do anything because I'm, I'm being obedient to what I've been commanded to do. So therefore, I'm earning it already just by proxy of saying that I'm a Christian, giving my life to the Lord, and just doing my best. And so a religious spirit is going to upset your apathy in that place. But it also will rob those of you that want to fully surrender and say, you just need to work harder because you're not good enough yet. And so what I want to do in this room is break off that religious spirit that's trying to choke out what God is actually trying to do in this house and over this region. So in that place, guys, it's just, it's a place of surrender. Lord, you have more. You have more. Your bride has yet to be completely fulfilled and resembling the groom fully. We're getting there. We're getting there. So just in your own life, whatever that checklist looks like to you, I'm either offended right now because, I mean, all these people, it's the same people always down at the altar and they're all emotional and hyped up. I'm a good Christian. Don't, don't like sit back on that apathetic mindset. 
It is a religious spirit trying to rob you from experiencing the fullness of the Holy Spirit in your life. And, and those of you that are driven by the adrenaline rush and the emotion of what God is doing, don't allow that part of your flesh to be satisfied. Press in in your spirit and crucify the flesh to fully manifest who God has called you to be. So right now in this room, I just come against every religious spirit yeah. that seeks to rob and steal and destroy what God is doing in this room and in this church right now and over this region. We break the power of every religious spirit in this room. We break it off of us right now in Jesus' name. And it does not have a place here. We will not allow apathy and offense to steal what God is doing in this house and in this region. And God, I declare over this house and over this region the fullness of the manifestation of the sons and daughters of God that we will walk in the authority and the anointing of Jesus Christ because that work was done on the cross and I'm choosing to align myself with that work by crucifying my flesh. And Lord, help me in that. So in Jesus' name, we just release that, the Spirit of God over this place. God, as, as we surrender these things to you, as we, re, we, we surrender our failures and our faults, as we surrender the, the heartbreak and the heartache, as we surrender the things that we think we need and want, as we surrender them to you, God, I pray that you will fill us with the fullness of what you have. Release the fullness of what it is that you want to do in us this morning, God, and in this church today. And God, let it radiate from this place. May this entire region be affected today by what it is that you're doing in this house. God, that every heart would be surrendered to you. Lord Jesus, come and have your way. Come and have your way in me this morning. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, and I will call. Call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. For I am yours, and you are mine. Yes, come on, give him a shout of praise this morning. How we love you, Jesus. Come on, this step over this boat right here. For some of you, just, just stepping out of your seat, this was the step over the boat, and you, you, you've never believed that this would hold you. You thought it would hold somebody else, but you've never believed that, that pushing in like this, drawing closer like this, out of a safe place and into a, a dangerous place, and really into the safest place there ever could be, the presence and arms of Jesus. I wanna encourage you this morning that what you've called, been called to step out into, that is not your foundation. What you've been called to stand on, that, that, that is not what you're grounded in. Your foundation is in Jesus Christ, and you stand on the rock and the promises that are yes and amen, on the word that is always true. When you worship, it's from a place of confidence that he is who he says he is. Jesus. And Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaking, <laughs> I've never been more glad. I put my faith in Jesus. That's it. Cause he's never lied. He's faithful through generation. Oh. So why would he fail now? He won't. Come on, somebody say. And I've still got joy in chaos. Yeah. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under
storms anymore. For somebody down here, just before you go back, say, and I've still got joy in chaos. What? I've got peace that makes. Sounds good, Gary. And I won't be going. No, 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 no. Because I built my Y'all can have a seat here if you want to. He won't. He won't. He won't fail, and he won't fail. <laughs> and he won't, he won't, no, no, no. Even if you don't have any other song to sing, sometimes that's just the one. Satan never whisper in your ear, that's not going to work. That worship's not going to work. That prayer's not going to work. You can just say, 
and he won't fail and he won't fail he won't and if you need Raf to come with you and bring his B3 with him I feel like I need that sometimes you know I think I think Jesus would have backed himself up on his organ if he could have. <laughs> Lord. How many of y'all are just grateful for Raf? He's so good. He's so good. He's so much better on the keyboard than me. And he, like, is all humble about it. Like, oh, Pastor Zach, show me that thing that you did. I'm like, come on, guy. I'm beating you in the hair department by about five minutes, and that's, that's it. You know? Everything else, he's got me. Listen, turn with me to John 4. And uh, I just, man, I want to encourage you. Like, what, what a word that Pastor John brought this morning. Um, because this is, this is what it's about. This is why you're here. This is why I'm here. This is why the Lord brought me here, was because worship uh, sets the stage for whatever else it is that God wants to do. Um, and sometimes your worship comes out in an act of radical sacrifice. Sometimes it comes out in an act of radical obedience. Sometimes it comes out in just simply uh, denying yourself, crucifying your flesh, and, and choosing what the Lord wants instead of what you want or what the world wants for you. And saints, I wanna encourage you that, that every time we do that, every time we choose that, we give him a place to reign, one decision at a time. This wasn't just a, you've heard me say it a million times, this wasn't just a card you filled out at a Billy Graham crusade, or th this wasn't just an altar call you came down to uh, at summer camp when you were a kid. Uh, it might have started there, but it doesn't end until we come before his throne fully, unhindered by the things of this world. And in the meantime, every day, every step is a little bit closer. Amen? And so I want to encourage you to press in, sing a new song. What is a new song? What is a new song? Well, a new song for somebody that, that you know, turns cartwheels and waves flags and screams in tongues at the top of their lungs. I was telling the first service this morning, for some of us, a new song is, is just a whisper. Because nothing about your life is quiet. And the Lord is saying, hey, let's, let's try it down here. A little bit softer now. That might be a new song. That might draw something out of you that, that the callousness of decibels ha has uh, drowned out. There might be a, a sweet whisper of surrender that the Lord would just love to, to use and to, to, to put to work bearing fruit for the kingdom. And for some of you that are, like Pastor John said, that you're still wrestling with the religious piece, just, just lifting your hands up might be a new song. It might be the same song with new actions. You know what I'm saying? Mm, 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 mm. You're not afraid to do that one. You're not afraid to do that one. I was speaking at a, um, no, I can't tell that story. I probably can't tell that story. Still too many religious people in here. Hey, oh, just kidding, no. Uh, let's see, wait, oh no, this is the second service. I can tell the story. Um, <laughs> just kidding. This one's televised. All right, so John 4 is a story that worship people, that's what I'm going to start calling real Christians from now on, worship people. Uh, it's a story that worshipers love because it, it's some of the, the planks in our platform. Jesus shows up and he explains to this woman of questionable background, jury is still out on exactly what was going on in her life. Um, we're given some details that lead us to believe maybe she was promiscuous, maybe she just had a, a, a history of, of bad marriages and relationships, or, or there are some other thought out there that this was actually a very wealthy woman of influence, and, um, and, and her marriages had to do with that. There, there are a lot of really cool things about that. Unfortunately, we're not even going to get to that part of the story today. Um, but we love this story because Jesus comes out with this, with this profound epic statement. She's kind of, 
She's trying to change the subject, as anybody would when you're trying to talk to them about something uncomfortable. And she's saying, well, you know, some people say you got to worship here. Some people say you got to worship there. You know, if you're a rabbi, if you can read my mail, let's stop reading my mail and let's just talk about something general and, you know, unintrusive like worship. <laughs> and, and he says, the time is coming and is now here when true worshipers aren't defined by the parameters of a mountaintop or a city or a temple or a high place. True worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. Now, I could probably do like a nine-part series if I did series on just that line because it's so loaded. But for us this morning, the word that Pastor John brought up here and, and dropped a bomb on us is there are two sides to this thing. And usually we pick a side. But one of the things we cover in premarital counseling, if you ever do premarital or marriage counseling, with us, we talk about how in marriage, in a marriage relationship, there are no sides anymore. There's no like court case where, you know, the defendant calls the whatever to the state. You know, there's, no, there's none of that because there aren't two separate things. There are no two distinguishable things. The two have become one, one thing, one side, one purpose to defend and to uphold. And so when Jesus says spirit and in truth, it's that worship is the combination of two things. The truth of God, the truth of his word, the infallible, inerrant word, the, the promises that are unfailing, that are yes and amen, and then the spirit. And in this region of the United States, we take a lot of pride in the truth piece. In fact, I've seen songwriters and worship leaders crucified because there might be a line or a word in their song that could possibly be interpreted as something that might potentially chafe with somebody's theology. And, and here's what I've said about that. I've said, listen, the Holy Spirit led Jesus and the apostles to do a lot of things that chafed with theology, okay? And I believe that for us, if we're not willing to let stuff get chafed in our worship, I mean, and, and you know, as Pentecostals, there's probably some people in this room, and we err on the other side, where we just want to, everything to be in the spirit, regardless of whether or not there's any truth attached to it. And the sad thing is, which shouldn't be sad, it should be an awesome thing, the spirit is subject to the prophet. And what that means is that if we want to manipulate or abuse the gift of his power within us, we, we can do that. I want you to know, God took a big chance. It was a big risk in, in fulfilling Joel's prophecy. And, and the Holy Spirit being poured out, that's risky to entrust it to us because we are not infallible and we are not inerrant. No matter how many, you know, names you can drop, at the end of the day, it has to be married to truth. It has to be married with, with what the word really calls for and what the heart of God really was when it was written. And that's what we find when we worship in spirit and in truth. The truth holds the spirit accountable. We have to do that sometimes when people do things in the name of the Holy Spirit, but that are contrary to the word of God. We have to say, no, the word will hold the spirit accountable because that's not actually the spirit. That's your flesh flexing the spirit in an effort to achieve a desired result. And, and the word won't stand for that. So as long as we let the word hold that accountable and shine the light, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When you take the word out, we start falling all over the place. Good people full of the Holy Spirit. Falling all over the place like flies, dropping. Why? Because we can't see where we go without his word. And in the same way, you can have a flashlight that, that is like oh, 150,000 lumens, but if you don't have the strength to move forward, you're just shining a light on a place you'll never be without the Holy Spirit. 
true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. That's got nothing to do with the message this morning. We're not even going to make it there. But if somebody has to leave early because you get offended, I want you to at least have that to go home. Okay. Dessert comes first here at HPC. All right. So John 4, I love this story. And how many of you guys, when you, when you get into the word and the Lord is really leading you there and you're going after truth, but it's the spirit that's going there with you, that's empowering you to get there. What happens is we jump into a Bible story that we've heard a thousand times, that we've heard messages on from preachers who preach, you know, phenomenally and are world renowned. And we're like, I know this story. And that, those words are the most dangerous ones we can ever say as believers because we can miss whatever detail, whatever life, whatever thing needs to pop today for such a time as this. This word is alive, saints. So let it live inside you this morning. Father, bring it to life in us. Therefore, chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, parentheses, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were. Verse 3, and I want you to tune in here, lean into this, because this is where we're going to park for a few minutes. He left Judea and went away again into Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Details, details, details. And Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There's so much here. There's so much here. You can ask the first service. I mean, we were like, we were pushing it. It was like, to every point could be a message. So we're going to go quick. But the first thing I want to point out is that when John records Jesus... It is, it is with honor and in respect of the fact that Jesus didn't do anything the Father didn't tell him to do. Everywhere he went, it was because there was a, a divine propulsion behind him, as is true with us as believers. There is divine propulsion pushing you in the will and the way of the Father towards the destiny he's called you to. The, the problem is we don't have to submit to that propulsion. And some of us... We, we try to turn sideways, and so we get, like, pushed sideways, and then we try to kind of get out of the stream, and then we're, like, over here, and then we're falling off the stage. Why? Because sometimes the Lord's pushing us in a direction that doesn't make sense or in a place that we ought not think that we should be or go. So when John writes this down, you've got to understand, when he says he had to pass through Samaria, I want to just point something out. No, he didn't. He didn't actually have to pass through Samaria. In fact, it was, it was very uncommon for a good Jew, especially one respected as a rabbi, it was uncommon for him to take the path that he took. And so I know John, and, and I love John's uh, emotion and passion for the Lord. And I feel like if it was John was doing this, if he had done like a book on tape instead of just write the letter, I feel like... At this line, he would say, he left Judea and went away again into Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. I feel like if John was just saying it out loud, that's how it would sound. Because Samaria was unclean. It was, it was a, a mongrel race of people, a hybridization that were only half Jew, half good, godly people. And the other half counteracted whatever good there was in the good half and made them totally unworthy to the point that people on a, on a religious pilgrimage, which is the biggest reason why you would go from Judea up into Galilee or Galilee back down to Jerusalem, uh, was for a festival or a feast or something of that religious nature, you wouldn't want to go through the seedy part of town to get to church. It, it puts you in the bad frame of mind, right? It's like, it's like driving through certain areas of Providence, you know, where there's certain signs and, and certain things happening on the streets and things that just, like, make you feel gross and icky. And you're like, no, nah, I'm going to take the scenic route through the east side where everybody's a good Christian. <laughs> <laughs> it 
Anyway, at least a Jew. I don't know about a good Christian, but <clears throat> end of day, what you, what, you, what you find is that if you do a little research, you find out that there were actually other far more commonly traveled routes to get from Judea to Galilee. Could we have exhibit A, please? This, uh, just yesterday, I want you to know how good Dave LeBeau is. Just yesterday, I asked him, I said, I need an aerial shot from flown over the Holy Land. He was there on vacation, and he hopped in the company helicopter um, and, uh, and took this for us. So uh, give it up for Dave LeBeau real quick. When the rest of us are on vacation, Dave is still working. And actually, when Dave is on vacation, Dave is still working because he was on vacation when I texted him for this. So I just want to point out a couple of things here that, that we need to grab, okay? You can see three different colored lines. In fact, is that the Italian flag? <laughs> who, who chose these colors? Anyway, on the left, you have what is called Via Maris. And in certain points of history, when this was Philistine territory, it was called the Way of the Philistines because it comes right up through there along the Mediterranean, but in a territory that would uh, now modern-day Palestine. But the idea is this was a, a commonly traveled route for commerce coming through the Mediterranean Sea. So you would come into one of these ports and you would hop on this path, this road, to go north and south. Another way that was more common for Jews was the red path. And if you were Jesus and you were in Jerusalem or Judea or this southern area, what you would do is you would head east, cross the Jordan, and ride north up the, the eastern bank until you got up here. This is an area called Perea. And then you would cut left and then get to where you were going, all in an effort to avoid Samaria. The red path is called the King's Highway, and much of it is actually interstate in the Middle East today. But the path that Jesus took is the white one, right up the middle. And that road is actually called the Way of the Patriarchs by many historians, because long before there were Samaritans or even a Samaria for them to be from, this was the way that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would travel through Canaan, through the land that would one day be known as the promised land. And so because it went through the seedy part of this area of the world, because it, it went through a place that was unclean, most of the time it would be avoided. And yet Jesus makes it clear that we have to go through Samaria. I want to ask a couple of questions this morning because... In this church, we put a lot of emphasis on where God's calling you. We talk a lot about your destiny, your purpose. We talk a lot about the assignment and the mandate and the anointing and the calling of God that's on your life. We talk about it and we preach about it and we pray about it and we lean into it. And so many in this room, you're walking in it. But as I tried to get to the woman at the well and the Lord put up the stop sign right here and I felt him call us to dig. So I want to ask you this question. Number one, how are you getting where God's called you? How are you getting there? What path are you taking? What are you passing through on your way? Is it possible that in an effort to play it safe or avoid uncomfortable confrontations that we end up taking a longer road and missing much of what we were meant to see along the way. Because here's the thing about the Lord. He's not American. I know that comes as a big shock to some Republicans in the room. Myself being one of them. I'm like, but you were really, and then Lori's like, no, he wasn't. And I'm like, but he would, and Lori's like, he won't. He won't. All right, all right, all right. Just kidding. We're all about getting from A to B. 
our sights get set on a thing, whatever it is, the American dream, the goal, the, the, the diploma, the, the degree, the, the, the promotion, the career, the re- retirement, the, the dream house, the whatever. And we will do anything to get from A to B. That's why as Christians, going all the way back, I mean, let's see, up until like the, the 30s, up until the Great Depression, um, People weren't as obsessed with heaven as they, as they were following that. In fact, uh, heaven was not, it wasn't thought about, sung about, preached about in the same light. People, people around the 1930s when um, the simple, Mc, Amy Simple McPherson, when the, the revivalists would travel through the Midwest setting up the tents and, and doing uh, all these incredible sawdust floor revivals and people were getting saved by the droves, they were coming out of a place of desperation and they needed to be given hope. And so rather than the hope just being Jesus, it, it evolved into this thing of, well, you have to get your sights set on heaven. Now that doesn't sound like a bad thing, when Jesus says, you know, seek first the kingdom. But when Jesus says, seek first the kingdom, he meant in a way of bringing the kingdom to you, not just hiding until you came there. But we all of a sudden started writing songs, hymns, like, oh, just over in the glory land. Beulah land. We started writing songs that were all about just just a few more days, and I'm going to get there, and I'll see the king. One fine day, all the troubles of this world. And, and, our, and our worship began to take on this, this radically different thing than what it was for the early church. The early church was interested in establishing the kingdom of God. That's why, that's why the apostolic ministry was so was thriving the way that it was because the whole point was to establish the throne and government of heaven here on the earth. When we get obsessed with just arriving at a destination like heaven, we forget, we lose sight of all the incredible things that were supposed to happen between here and there, and everything becomes a means to an end. How am I going to get there? And we will do whatever. We justify anything. We'll do anything to get there. But in the eyes of the Father... There's no such thing as just a means to an end. Every single thing is an end in and of itself. Every day, every hour, every conversation, every thought that you entertain is a step along the way between here and there. And I want you to know something. It matters to God. It matters to God. So... As we talk and think and dwell and preach and pray and sing about where we're called to be, let's let's give heed to the heart of the Father as Jesus did to know that today, this day, I'm going to take you on a path that maybe you weren't predicting. I'm going to take you right through a place that you would have maybe otherwise avoided. The King's Highway, the red one, around to the east. That took five to seven days. The green one, Via Maris, the way of the Philistines, that took even longer. The white line, the way of the patriarchs, three days. Three days to get from A to B. This is the irony of this. We turn one day into a thousand years. We turn what should have been a three-month journey through the wilderness into 40 years. Why? Anybody in here, just you are just hell-bent on learning the hard way? Nobody. They were all in the first service. Early risers. I'm going to make the most of this day because it's going to take me a long time. (laughs) As many times as I'm going to mess this up. My God, help us. If you're writing things down, get this. Don't walk in a circle where the Lord drew a straight line. Please. The harvest is great and the laborers are few. I don't need you doing laps around the outside of the field. We got to get through this thing. Okay? We got to get through this thing. And every day and every step and every stalk of wheat along the way matters to the heart of the Father. Even Samaria. 
even the seedy part of town, even the half-breeds and the broad-breeds and the mongrels and everything else, it matters to the Lord. It matters to the Lord. That's what the wilderness was, saints. The wilderness was, was the long way around out of fear. Many of us, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, rescued us right out of bondage, out of slavery. Brought us through the wilderness. Maybe you're proud that it didn't take you 40 years. But what happens is he can bring the man out of the, the wasteland, but it's up to us to get the wasteland out of the man. We end up coming right into the promises of God with the sand of the wilderness still in our shoes. And it causes us to walk in ways that would avoid uncomfortable things. It causes us to take the long way around out of fear, out of, out of reluctance or hesitation. My family and I, we were just in um, the West this last week. We, we flew out to Jackson Hole and rented an RV and we drove through the Grand Tetons and did some stuff. And then we went up to Yellowstone and we did some stuff. And we went up into Montana and did some stuff. And then we came back down. And um, I, this is our first experience doing this RV thing. My mom lived in an RV for 10 years, my mom and my stepdad, and um, traveled around the country. And that was like, they didn't have a house. Like that was their permanent residence was an RV and uh, several RVs over that decade actually. And so I thought that like, I could like probably do this vicariously through the fact that it's been parked in my backyard for, you know, months on end. And I'm like, I, I, I get this. I know how this works. You know, everything happens in a tank and then you empty the tank. I get it. You know, then you run on some water and then you can drink the water and I get it. Okay. We can do this. So we're excited. We've never done this. So what do we do? I uh, book an RV. And it, it wasn't like a fleet or like a commercial RV. It was like a private personal, sort of like an airbnb RV out in Jackson Hole. So we were going to fly out. We're going to pick this up. They're going to pick us up at the airport in it, and we're going to drive. And I have this thing. I'm like Pastor Daniel. We have this in common that, like, if we're going to have something, we're, we want the nice one. You know what I'm saying? You want the nice thing. You want the shiny, the big thing. And so um, when I go to rent an RV, I'm going to get, like, an RV off MTV Cribs. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm going to get one on like spinners and systems and lights. And I'm going to make sure that, you know, I want the one with the waterbed in the back. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I'm like, you know, we're going to have this thing for a week. Let's live it up, babe. So I go and I, and I get rent this like brand new monstrous RV. And I'm so excited about it. I'm showing people pictures of it like it's mine, but it's not mine. You know, I'm not lying about it, but I'm not not lying either. And, uh, and so we're, uh, so everything's planned. Everything's perfect for this trip. We're going to fly out last week and literally like days, I don't know, maybe like a half a dozen days, we get an email, your RV has been canceled, canceled after like four, five months. And I'm like, this is, this is terrible. I, I just, I want to be really transparent. I want to be honest with you this morning. I lost my peace. Okay. Not my salvation, but definitely my peace, <laughs> definitely my joy, definitely some sanctification. <laughs> and, and I spent a lot of time in prayer over the, the next couple of days as I was frantically trying to book another RV. And uh, I'm calling my mom. I'm like, intercede, pray with me. Like, this is bad. We're going to fly out there. Everything's booked, our campgrounds, our spots, our everything, tickets, everything's done. God help us. So... As everything's falling apart in my life, um, my, wife, my wife steps up and, and books an RV. And uh, everybody say thank God for Ashley. So we, we, but Ashley does not have the same like sentimental significance that I do to the finer things in this regard. And so... Now, I want you to know, beggars can't be choosers when you're coming in hot like, like we're packing our suitcases to get on the plane and still trying to figure out. Like we're sitting at an airport in Atlanta, Georgia, and a layover trying to sort out whether or not we're going to have an RV on the other end. And it was like that, 
right? It was like faith. Like, I'm going to step out over this boat. <laughs> right? You call me on an RV share. Anyway, so, so this was a different RV. Wasn't quite as big, wasn't quite as new. And I'll be honest with you, like, when it pulled up, I expected Uncle Eddie to get out of it, okay? <laughs> That's the kind of RV it was, okay? You know, like when it comes with a roll of duct tape in case of, you know, it's one of these. And, and let's just say it was well loved and used because it was like everything in the entire unit was loose, okay? So it's like just you're kind of riding and going like, there's kind of like this going on. It's like one of those belts you strap on to lose weight, but it wasn't. It was just your seatbelt, you know? <laughs> it was, everything was loose. There were noises coming from everywhere. And I'm like, praise the Lord, we have an RV. And so here's the deal, right? With the RV, it's like, now I've driven 15, 18 passenger vans for schools and, and pulled big trailers and traveled across the country. And I, I, I love to drive. I'm a phenomenal driver. <laughs> I don't, I don't love to drive legally, but I, I love to drive. And so I'm like, I can drive this thing. It's no, no problem. And uh, we get in and we take off. And for the first, you know, couple of hours or whatever, you know, the first couple of days actually, we're in the Grand Tetons. And most of the time, everything's like long and straight and easy. But as we get into Yellowstone in the second half of the trip, you're driving around like harrowing cliff edges that drop plummet straight to the pits of hell. And, and you know, it's like you look down and, and you know, there's people that fell off 10 years ago still falling. <laughs> and, and it's like, this, this, is, this is nuts. You know, this is, this is happening in this. And there's tires like going off the side and there's tractor trailers coming in the other way and there's lots of tourists that don't know how to drive and everybody's just out there you know, trying to navigate this thing and with their life and their teeth on edge. And, um, and so we go out, we go out uh, one day and everything's like two hours away from everything else. Yellowstone is huge. It is literally the size of Rhode Island and Delaware together. 314,000 something square miles or something like that. It's nuts. So we're driving everywhere all across and, and one day in particular, we had to take a path um, to come into the Lamar Valley and you're just doing this on hairpin turns and you know this thing you're supposed to downshift in these going downhill and um the Camaros you understand how this works with a big fat trailer pulling by you're supposed to downshift well this vehicle doesn't want to downshift it doesn't want to upshift it it wants to do something else and and so you know noises are coming out and Ashley and I are getting stressed out and I'm like sweating and this thing's like coming around the edge and I'm like Pastor John, get the prayer team just to intercede because it's getting scary. And we get all the way where we're going, and I'm like, okay, there's another way back because there's like a big circle, and like we, we'll just go the other way back, right? So we're not on that path. And it comes time to leave, and it's like, oh, no, no, no. Zach, we have dinner reservations at, at the uh, Old Faithful Lodge at 530 and it's gonna take two hours to go this way and an hour and a half to go this way. So guess what? We're going back the way we came, back around all of these turns, over these cliff edges. You're watching like herds of bison plummet to their death. I mean, it, it was dark, it got dark. And, and I'm like, all right, all right, we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it. And I want you to know, we made it to the reservation on time, okay? But the point is this, sometimes when we've had a bad experience, Sometimes when, when we've traveled a path or part of our journey embedded fear into us, we're reluctant to ever take that way again. We will refuse. We would rather miss our reservation. We would rather stop at the convenience store and get Kraft macaroni and cheese and heat it up in the microwave that might work and it might not than to actually make it where we're supposed to be on time. We'll choose the longer way. Why? Because of whatever, whatever we've suffered, whatever discouragement or, or disappointment or embarrassment, whatever happened along the way. 
and we make a decision and what we end up doing sometimes, saints, is we miss so much of what God has for us because the views, what we get exposed to, the prayers we learn to pray in those harrowing moments when the back axle's off the side of the cliff and the front axle, and you're only in rear wheel drive and you're like, Lord, something's gotta happen. That's the way of the patriarchs. That's the path the original men of God, the OG group, traveled. It was scary. They would go to a place they knew not of. They would make sacrifices to a God that had not yet been a burning bush to Moses. He had not yet sent the plagues to Egypt. He had not yet parted the seas. He had not yet drowned Pharaoh's army. He had not yet uh, brought down the walls of Jericho. None of those things happened. This is a walk that requires faith. This is not just about where you're going. It's about every step along the way until you get there. It's interesting. I think sometimes we can, we can read this story and you can think, well, Zach, doesn't God actually get a kick out of taking us on the long way sometimes? The more difficult way, the more dangerous way sometimes. Yeah, he does around the outside. But the prophet also writes that he maketh straight the path of the righteous man. And what that means is that when there's a wilderness in front of you, you don't have to walk through the wilderness. You get to walk on a path that he's prepared for you. You can step off that path and away from the light that shines on that path and fall flat on your face over and over and over again until, yeah, you get there. I'm not going to take heaven away from you. I'm not going to sit and stand up here and say, if you don't get on that path, you're going to go to hell. No, it's not about that. I believe that our future and forever is sealed by the blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen. But this isn't about your forever. It's your right now. It's your today. It's the places that we still have to walk through in order to get there. He's making your path straight. The next line, again, a detail. So he came, he came to a city in Samaria called Sikar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. I want to talk about this for a second. This story of when this whole thing was divvied up. It comes out of late Genesis. And what's happening here is Jacob is an old man. He's 147 years of age at this point when he's about to die, and he's divvying up the land. Um, Joseph is in his late 50s, and his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, are in their mid-20s. And at this point, something very interesting happens that was very unusual for the, the passing out of inheritance. And it's this. Jacob passes over Joseph and hands his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, their parcels to carry on Joseph's lineage and inheritance. Now, this whole scene is taking place in Egypt. And I find this very interesting because while Jacob, who uh, was wealthy and his brothers who were wealthy because Pharaoh told Joseph to give them the best land in all of Egypt to settle in, by the way, God's people, classic favor, right? Joseph is an incredibly rich man. He is second in command to Pharaoh and overseeing all the land. And so when Jacob is passing out inheritances, it's kind of ironic. It feels almost sort of petty at this point to say, here are the plots of land in Canaan, by the way, the promised land that you're supposed to inherit one day that you don't even know about. Joseph hadn't been there since he was a kid. In fact, Joseph hadn't been there since his brothers sold him into slavery. That's how they all wound up in Egypt to begin with. So what's interesting about this encounter is that Jesus rolls up to a town that was the fulfillment of a prophetic promise, a promise to those patriarchs and their faithfulness to that road that they traveled, that it would be on this land where my promises come to pass, that it would be in this place where your people become a great nation. 
that it would be right here. And so while all of this happens in the earlier part of the 400 years that the Hebrew people were enslaved in Egypt, here's something interesting that you might not have known. For the 40 years that the Jews walked around the wilderness, they carried with them an Egyptian sarcophagus. Do you know that? Not the kind that you get from a souvenir shop. They carried the embalmed, mummified remains of Joseph, whose burial preparations had been carried out in the way of Egyptian custom. But we read on in the book of Joshua that as the people of God finally do make it into the promised land, that the descendants of Ephraim and Manasseh, Joseph's people, end up claiming that place, this place, this town, the parcel called Shechem that was guaranteed to Joseph, and they lay his bones to rest there. Now, why does that matter to Jesus on his trip from Judea to Galilee? Because right now in Jesus's life, there's so much that he can relate to concerning Joseph. You see, Jesus was sent to be a savior to his people. Jesus was sent for his brothers to bow down to him, and yet he was rejected, betrayed, and sold into bondage. Like Joseph, Jesus was put into a hole with the hopes that he would be forgotten. But like Joseph, Jesus stood on the promises and the fulfillment of prophecy that the Father would do what he said he would do. It's in this story where Jesus repeats himself and says, a prophet's never welcome in his hometown. Can we, can we appreciate his frustration right now? He's leaving Jerusalem He's leaving the very people, the, the, the epicenter of the people for whom he was sent to save, having been rejected, having been despised. We see it, don't we? We see it. He says it. He says, I can't, I can't do anything in these regions because there's a lack of faith. How is it that I'm raising people from the dead? I'm literally opening blind eyes and healing lame legs and, and, and restoring um, everything, casting out demons. And all they see when they look at me is a carpenter's kid. Anybody been there? Joseph, as a young man, sharing dreams and visions I saw this picture of these stalks of wheat and they were all bowing down. And then I, I had this other dream I want you guys to hear about. It's like the stars and the moon and they're bowing down and it was me. I was the sun, they were bowing down. But maybe he could have tempered those revelations with a, you know, a little more humility, perhaps. I don't know. But the point is this. He was sent to be the savior of those brothers. And they threw him in a hole in the hopes that he would be forgotten about. Well, that pit was not the only hole that was dug in this area. You see, Jacob dug another hole and hit water. This would be a well that would bring life and sustenance to not only his time there and his family as shepherds, but it would become a place where the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords would walk up to one day, wearied from his own rejection and discouragement. Tired, tired of being chased out of town, tired of, of, of the denials, but it's where he would lower, drink and be refreshed and saints, I read this story and I think of Jesus and I think, you know what? Maybe the woman at the well wasn't really about the woman at all. Maybe this whole story 
was about Jesus saying, no, I've got to go through Samaria. In fact, I've got to go through a particular town in Samaria. I need to sit down and be reminded of the faithfulness of my father. I need to, I need to drink of a well that screams his promises are true. I need to settle down in a place where just 15 miles outside of town in a little suburb called Dothan, my ancestor Joseph was thrown into a, a hole, a dry hole and sold into slavery, but was brought back around full circle to where he could come here and rest. So Jesus sat down and he rested. Whatever happened with that woman, whatever revelation was made to her, those are the symptoms. Those are the side effects of us walking in the way the Father leads us. That's what happens when we're obedient. That's what happens when we go to those places of refreshing. When we take the path less traveled. When we, when we reconcile the inconvenient and uncomfortable confrontations with the fact that it's in this very place where the OG dug a hole so that thousands of years later we could be refreshed by it would you stand the best part about this story he has this whole interaction with the woman at the well the disciples come back they're all shocked that he's talking to her they're like you know she's a Samaritan right not to mention that she's here at this time of day. She's probably somebody you shouldn't be seen with. This was still early on in Jesus' ministry. So they're, they're still grappling with how uncomfortable Jesus was going to make them. But it says after that whole encounter... And the Lord just like wrecked her life. And she goes back into the town sharing her testimony. What happens is that village, that town ends up coming back. They come to him and they hear truth. And he ends up staying there two days. In that place where he never should have been. If it had just been up to the religious persuasions of the day. But he finds himself there faithful to the journey the Father set before him. And in that place, from that place, he is refreshed. And I want to read this verse to you, 45, 43. After two days, he went forth from there. From where? Sakar, there in that region in Samaria. Shechem, Joseph's inheritance. He went forth from there into Galilee. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. But verse 45 says, so when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did. I believe there's folks in this room this morning, and you've been trying to walk in obedience. You've been trying to do it right. But it feels like what you're getting for it is rejection. It's humiliation. It's discouragement and disappointment. It's denial. Jesus understands that better than you could ever imagine. But I believe that if he was here today, he would say, stay faithful to that road less traveled. Stay faithful to the well that was dug for you. Stay faithful to the living water that refreshes you in those times of weariness. I don't think Jesus was just weary from the geographical arid climate and journey. I think he was weary from all the crap he was getting from the very people he came to save. So for those in this room and you're feeling tired, the fall is upon us and it's a time when momentum builds and, and things happen and things change and you're feeling under the weight of the last season, of the last rejection, of the last disappointment, I want you to know that there's a well here for you. There's a well that men and women dug in this region hundreds of years ago 
who fled from the bondage of religion to establish a place where we could be free to pour out and to be poured in. And we are living in a time when those wells are being opened, when those ropes are being lowered and that life is coming out. If you're in here this morning and that's you and you're tired and you're weary, would you step out of your seat and meet me down here? If you know God's called you to something and you're not sure if you're gonna make it there without that refreshing water, without that life, without a, we, we, see, we were never meant to make it without that. Like that's, that's pride. If we think we're gonna accomplish something for the Lord or we think we're gonna pull off some great heavenly divine assignment, that's pride, that's flesh. Crucify that. Take a couple more steps forward over here. Thank you. Yeah, he's got some people coming down the aisle here. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Your deliverance. Look where I'm standing now. These hands that once were. He's called you to the, the way of the patriarchs. He's called you to the path where maybe it feels like you've been skipped over like Joseph, looked over, forgotten. Like whatever was meant to come down, maybe it skipped your generation, kept going. But I want you to know that the Lord has a place for you to rest. He's reserved it. It's a place that will bring refreshing to all those who stop along the way. But it requires obedience. It requires getting off that more traveled, maybe safer path where we won't get those cockeyed looks from people. It means forsaking the way everybody else is going and coming back to that place that was always meant to refresh you, revive you. to receive New England is waiting New England is desperate New England is broken hungry thirsting they've heard the stories but they're wondering if it's true what they need is not a church that's willing to just play it safe what they need is not another church that will spend 40 years wandering around in the desert when it could have just been three months. What they need is a people who are gonna run where the Father's called them, who are gonna enjoy along the way everywhere the Father makes the statement that His promises are yes and amen, that the prophecies have been fulfilled, that He came for those who were rejected, who were despised, and that's why we are here too. So Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters at this altar. I thank you, Lord, for the, the faithfulness and the commitment. I thank you, God, for, for the fact that, Lord, you don't punish us when we try to go around the outside, but Lord, you, you pick us up as soon as we're willing to say, Father, here am I, send me, put me back on that path where I belong. Lord, that you restore the years that the locusts ate, that you bring back 
God, uh, all that's been lost and you restore it for your great name's sake. And so God, we pray today that you would take those who have surrendered themselves to this end, God, that, that you would find in us a people who would be faithful to the way of the patriarchs, that we would be faithful Lord, and found righteousness uh, under that covering of Jesus as we travel this path, as we stop where we're supposed to stop and go where we're supposed to go along the way. God, I pray for a refreshing over those who have grown weary in this, in this assignment. Lord, your word says to not grow weary in well-doing, but you also say, when you do, come to me and I will give you rest. You offer us that exchange of that yoke that's easy and that burden that's light. So we take off a spirit of heaviness this morning. And we accept that drink that'll cause us to never thirst again. In Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' mighty name. Yeah, we're going to continue to worship down here this morning. Push in, press in. If you need to leave, God bless you. Have the best day of your life. We love you. Well, the storms may come and the winds may blow. I will remain steadfast and let my heart learn when you speak a word. It will come to pass. Oh, great is your faithfulness to Say my will pray.